Greetings, quality people. I'm Jeff Vieira. And I'm Norm Howe, and this is The Fearless Workplace. Jeff, our guest this week is David Trozen, Managing Director of Health Sciences Certification at uh, NSF International's Global Health Sciences Certification Business. And that includes dietary supplements, sports supplements, OTCs. Uh, Dave leads a team whose focus is providing companies the most current and credible auditing, testing, certification services. And we're taking a little bit of a right turn here, Jeff, because usually we're talking about fear within a single workplace. But today we're talking a little bit about fear uh, outside of a single workplace, but along uh, an entire supply chain. And through David's work at NSF, he has helped hundreds of companies achieve their safety and quality goals and gain access to retailers and professional sports organizations. And most importantly, cultivate trust among consumers. So welcome, David. Uh, and tell us, what, how do you do that? What, uh, what, what exactly is the service that, that you provide? First, let me say thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here with you gentlemen. And uh, uh, d just to walk back a little bit uh, to describe NSF, NSF is an accredited standards rating body and certification body. So we have written nearly 100 national consensus standards that are accredited by the American National Standards Institute. So we help different uh, industries comply with, with uh their, their safety goals to set a, set the bar at a level that everybody can comply with. Everybody can, it's usually based on regulations. So when we're writing a consensus standard, we start with uh, required regulations and industry best practices, and then companies are audited or their products are tested to those standards so they can bear a uh, certification seal. The important part about that is then because it's accredited, somebody's watching the watcher. So every year, uh, ANSI comes in and looks over our shoulder and makes sure that we are holding everybody to the same standard across the board, that nobody's getting any uh, easy pass just because they may be a, a more reputable or bigger company. So that's that's a little bit about NSF. Uh, in terms of writing standards, in terms of certifying the standards, we then go out and work with companies. They, they bring us in and we audit them on a regular ba basis or test their products on a regular basis or both if they're vertically integrated. And we make sure they're compliant with the, uh, the appropriate standards for their industry. And it's a, it's a lather and repeat because it's, it's like anything. Once you hit a goal, you don't stop trying, you keep measuring. And so we go back on a very regular basis and continue to either measure the good manufacturing practices in a facility or um, we test their products on a regular basis to make sure they're hitting the mark that they care to hit. Now, David, uh, you're describing something that uh, doesn't uh, comport with what I know of the, the nutritional supplements industry. I thought this was stuff that was made up in somebody's kitchen, that had no standards, that was just out there causing all this havoc. Was that misinformation? You know, I hear it's, it's you hear this all the time. And, and for people within the supplements industry, it's a high point of frustration. When people find out what I do, they say, oh, well, supplements aren't regulated. And that's, it's, that's absolutely untrue. They are regulated. I think the appropriate uh, statement is they don't finish the sentences. Supplement, supplements are not regulated to the extent that drugs are. However, there, there are regulations for supplements, and the Food and Drug Administration uh, does inspect facilities and make sure they're doing uh, the right thing in those facilities as, as they can and have the resources to do. There's also requirements by the Federal Trade Commission. And so there's significant oversight in terms of, of supplement and supplement quality. I think the other thing, and I'm sorry, just let me put a, a finer point on that. When we say they're not regulated like supplements, I, I would go on to say there's not pre-market approval for supplements. And when I say they're not regulated like drugs, rather, um, there's not pre-market approval. So Whereas a drug has to go through clinical trials and have that pre-market approval before it gets in the marketplace, supplements can go into the marketplace first. And if they're found to be doing something uh, unscrupulous or making claims they shouldn't be made, 
that shouldn't be made, they're then they're then um, penalized for that or pull, pulled off the marketplace. Uh, there are some limitations in place as well that a supplement can't make statements or claims that would relate to curing, treating, or mitigating a disease. So if if I want to outsource, uh, say I, I want to market a nutritional product of some kind, uh, or you know any product for that matter, why why wouldn't I just go to a supplier and audit them myself and determine whether or not they can make the product correctly? I mean, why why would I be interested in having them? certified because i mean if i want to market the product i know what i want right well norm you're probably one of the very few people who actually could go audit your supply chain because you you teach this stuff for a living however the average supplement brand owner doesn't they're typically business people without either a a strong quality background or or a background in manufacturing and and that's why it's important to have you know, a third party accredited seal on the business. It means somebody like NSF is going in on a regular basis and not only, you know, looking under the hood, they're, they're looking at everything from when the raw material comes in the front or the back door to the, the finished product going out the front door and everything in between the testing, the cleaning, uh, the documentation, which is, is critical. So you want uh, an objective disinterested third party going in and looking at it because even the best quality control person can be in an environment and start to lose some objectivity. So it's good to have that outside set of eyes, a, a partner that uh, is going to work with you to make sure that everything remains on track. We've had a number of clients uh, call us and say the FDA was here last week. Thanks. We're really grateful you were here before they were. It really helped us be ready for that and, and minimize any findings. Now, so David, you... You said something else that was interesting there that, that uh, struck at the heart of my misinformation in my head around this. You're talking about a supply chain for supplements. Uh, so something whipped up in somebody's kitchen doesn't have much of a supply chain, right? You go to the grocery store, you get it, you whip it up. Uh, how complex are the supply chains in this industry? Um, they can go from hyper complex uh, to, you know, to... Um, pretty, pretty straightforward. You know, we, we could all log online and, and find, um, you know, an encapsulator and, and whip something and literally whip something up in our kitchen. There was a great documentary. I think it's called bigger, faster, stronger. And as part of that, the guy went and he bought the encapsulation machine online, uh, whipped up his formula, had an amazing looking label, then went over the home Depot, picked up day laborers, brought them back to his apartment, no protective equipment, so they're sneezing because there's lots of powder everywhere. And he's just encapsulating this stuff like crazy. And it was mostly just, um, you know, excipient that was going in there, very little active ingredient. And bam, within 48 hours, he was online selling. And so it can be incredibly complex or it can be incredibly simple and deceptive. And uh, it's really important to know, you know, the brand. I will say, you know, and this is not... A, this is not an indictment of Amazon. Amazon is is massive and, and makes up 80% of all online uh, supplement sales in the U.S. Um, there are some of the most reputable brands on Amazon, but there are also other other brands uh, that I've not heard of. And I'm not saying this because Amazon's I'm not Amazon is working really hard to make sure they're they're raising their standard. They're putting in requirements and they're working incredibly hard uh, to make sure that's the case. But the nature of a marketplace is they're not the retailer. It's not a brick and mortar store. And so when I go online and I search for, let's just say, you know, a fish oil. When it comes back and I only recognize about 10 to 20 percent of the brands and the rest of them, I have no clue who they are. And I've been in this business for a long time. That, that tells you something about the low barrier of entry, not necessarily to sell online, but just to produce a product. A friend uh, who was an eye surgeon asked me one time because he was interested in creating his own supplement product. And he said, you know, simply, what do I need to do to get in the supplement business? What do I need to have? And I said, a checkbook and a contract manufacturer. And and that's really what it is. Now, he's he's a very um, science-based uh, fellow. He's very educated. He's very scrupulous. He's not going to put something out 
that uh, that's you know going to miss the mark. But there are you know just as there are so many people want to have a quality product, and there are so many really good products in the marketplace. Uh, there are people who see the opportunity to, to make a buck, and they don't care about the health of the consumer. They don't don't care about the quality of the product. They simply care about making the consumer's dollars their dollars. And that's where we just really have to be educated. You have to know, you have to look for things like a, a third party certification, if I may, because that's the thing that tells the consumer that NSF looked at this and it has in there what it's supposed to have in there. And it doesn't have anything in there that's going to harm me. And that's the differentiator because there's not a single brand out there that says, we're okay. I mean, you know, we're, you're going to save some money. So go ahead and roll the dice. Every single brand you talk to says, we're fantastic. We, we are the height of quality by our product. And this is how you know. And how does, uh, uh, if I'm a supplier, what, what does being certified do for me? How does that lower my anxiety level? Yeah, that's a great question uh, on a number of levels. One, you want to find, if you have an issue, you want to find it with a trusted friend. You want to find it with somebody who's going to come in and say, we pointed these out to you and you can now fix them. Where you don't want to find them is with a regulator or your largest customer walking through the facility. So working with, a, with NSF, we're going through the facility. We're saying, here are your corrective actions. Now you have the opportunity to fix those and, and, get, you know, and become certified as opposed to uh, finding them, like I said, with a regulator where you could get a warning letter or, or worse, or with a critical customer who might walk through and say, that was unimpressive, I'm pulling business. And then there's the liability factor. I mean, from, from the standpoint, if you have an issue, it could potentially lead to either minor liability or serious adverse events that you know nobody wants uh, anybody to be harmed by a product that's coming out of their facility or at least nobody of, of repute does. And so it identifies that. And then in terms of risk management and doing the right thing, there are insurance companies that when they see that you are NSF certified in your facility, they will reduce your liability insurance costs. No different than if you put a, a fire alarm and a burglar alarm in your house, your insurance rates at home go down. It's the same thing for your liability insurance in the business. So uh, what we've seen is for the good players who go ahead and do this, certification actually pays for itself in terms of the cost of their insurance. And so it's, there's just a number of real benefits to it. I would add one further thing that you don't want to see coming in your door. In addition to a, uh, an irate uh, FDA inspector or an irate customer, uh, but a, uh, uh, a, uh, a greedy class action suit lawyer. Absolutely. 100%. That could ruin your whole day. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And, and, uh, and they're out there and it's, it's, it, it happens. And that's a great point. So David, uh, talking a little bit, shifting gears for a second from the producers within the industry to the consumers. Uh, we, we are at a time, at least in, in some parts of the world where we've had a more abundant source of food, and food supply than we've had in past ages on there. Uh, I know my, you know, parents were children during the Great Depression, and so they used to tell stories about how difficult it was at, at sometimes to get enough to eat. What is driving nutritional supplementation? Is there, is there a fear that consumers have that they're not getting sufficient amounts of nutrition through what they're able to, to get from, you know, onto their own table? You know, I think when you when you look at it, obviously over the last two and a half years, um, pandemic you know has driven a lot of that. So there's you, you you see spikes in different things just depending on on what's happening right now. Um, so a lot of immune health uh, has has received a lot of focus and attention over the last few years, uh, simply from the concern of 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 pandemic and supplement t supplements tend to be somewhat recession proof, I guess, to the extent that any business can be, because when things are good, people feel like they have the income to, to invest in their health. And when things aren't good, 
they think to themselves, well, we may not be able to afford that vacation, but we should be investing in our health because we don't want to, we don't want to get sick. And so that's, that's one thing that drives, uh, drives that it's people see that as an inexpensive investment in their longevity. What do, what do these supplements do for people? Well, I think it's important to manage it, 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 to manage expectations in terms of, think about the name supplement. It's a, it supplements a healthy diet. It supplements a healthy lifestyle. It doesn't forgive an unhealthy lifestyle. It does not replace a healthy lifestyle. So, you know, when, when people first find out what I do for a living, one of the very common questions I get is, what can I take to lose weight? And I, my answer is a few more laps around the neighborhood because there is no magic pill that's going to do that for you. So if, if you have a, a lifestyle where you're getting up and eating fast food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you're consuming a lot of alcohol and empty calories every day and, and sugars, no amount of supplements are going to forgive that. Uh, so if you are leading a healthy lifestyle, it'll be more uh, effective in terms of that, uh, in terms of overall health. And then you can get into specific things. Uh, so for instance, as Americans, we see studies all the time that, that we are deficient in vitamin D and that's come to attention, uh, into the attention of the, of the populace recently because of COVID, but even before that very deficient in vitamin D. So that's something probably where we should be looking at, uh, in terms of immune health and, and other things, uh, magnesium, uh, as a population, we are incredibly uh, deficient. What I said, the number I think I saw this week, 70%, maybe more are deficient in magnesium. Well, that can affect everything from, from sleep to uh, digestion and, and a whole number of other things. And so those are some, some general things. And then it can get condition or, or health specific. Are you trying to manage blood sugar levels? Um, are you just, are you trying to manage um, energy levels, uh, you know, brain health? liver health, you name it. And then you can, you know, supplement specifically to that. What, what does the, what do you do to uh, help the consumer to understand what, what constitutes a, a quality product in this, in this industry? Right. Uh, so we have a public listing. So any product that becomes certified by NSF, there's a listing on our website at nsf.org. And at the top of the of the um, of the website, there's a link that says, you know, certified products and and uh, and systems. And you can go in and click that. And under nutritional products, you can you can search. And so when a consumer sees a product that's listed there, they know it, it requires a couple things before any product is eligible to be certified by NSF. It has to be manufactured in a facility that is is. Um, uh, certified to the national standard for good manufacturing practices. And so it has to come from a good manufacturing environment. So that means NSF has been in that facility on, a, on an annual basis to inspect what's happening and make sure that, that any corrective action is being dealt with. After we leave, we don't just say, well, here's your list of corrective actions. We'll see you next year. Uh, they actually have a very limited period of time, 10 days, where they have to respond to their corrective actions and we review them and approve them or say, nope, you need to come back again. That's, that's not appropriate. Then the product is submitted to us on, on annual basis and we test it. We test it to make sure that it has in there what it's supposed to have in there. So whatever they're claiming is on the label, we're looking at and testing. And we're looking at uh, known contaminants to make sure that, that nothing harmful is going to be in the product. So microbiological contaminants or heavy metals, uh, pesticides, if it's appropriate, uh, and, and, and so forth. We also then review the label to make sure the label's not making any sort of claim that, uh, and, and we've seen crazy things on labels. Anything from as simple as one of the fun ones I saw very early on in my career is a guy sent me one and I, I was looking at it and I called him back. I said, either you've discovered something I'm unfamiliar with, or I think you have a typo on your label. I said, what do you mean? And the first ingredient was vitamin one. And I thought that's got to be really an awesome vitamin. It's the number one vitamin. It was vitamin A and they just made a typo on their label. So it could be something as simple as that, or somebody writes in there and says, you know, helps treat or cure. And that's where we will call that to their attention and say, until you fix this, it can't be certified. So from the whole, from the labels being accurate to the contents being accurate to being contaminant free, 
that's where the consumer can look at that and say, I know that I'm getting what I'm paying for it and it, it's, it's not going to harm me. So for the people that are working in this industry, the, not the day laborers that you were talking about in your example, but the folks whose actual profession is to produce these products, how does the work that you're doing help them? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, so it starts with NSF provides training and education so people can hire us to either come to their facility and train their whole staff or they can send people to trainings or they can log online and do trainings. And it can be as simple as a, a one-on-one class, you know, an overview on good manufacturing practice, practices to, you know, very specific things like culture change or how do you write an SOP. Uh, so it can get very specific. And there are, are um, you know, over 10, 10 plus classes that we offer in terms of, of, of that. Norm has taught those uh, for us in the past. The guy's great at, at teaching. I'll, I'll just call Norm out and say it's, it's really fun to sit in his classes because um, he, he has so much great experience. So it would start there. And then it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Who's, who's the objective set of eyes in your, in your facility? I have kids, and so I, I call it the invisible sock syndrome. You know, if a kid leaves a sock on the floor, they took off the first day. I'm thinking, I'm not going to say anything because I want them to see it and recognize they need to pick it up. And day two, now I'm, I'm starting to get ticked because nobody's seen it. But by, the, by day three or four, it's become invisible to me as well. So now the sock is completely invisible, and we're all stepping over it. It, the same thing can happen in a pr- production environment. We're going to get to that. We'll come back to fixing that sink. We will um, come back to fixing, even it can be as simple as fixing the lock on a label cabinet or, or a gap under a door where some vermin could get into your facility or pests could get into your facility. And then after a while, it becomes deprioritized and then it becomes an issue. And so we're that objective set of eyes that comes in the facility and says, did you notice that? And we're there for three days, you know, crawling through everything from paperwork to, um, to the facility and saying, did you notice that that needs to be fixed? Um, if you want to be compliant, that's, that's an issue. And it goes beyond the regulation, regulatory requirements for the facility. And, and the standard also looks into industry back best practices. David, you see a lot of different companies uh, switching gears for for just a second here. Uh, how how and and also at NSF, but uh, in in the companies that that you visit, how is the industry in general handling return to work? How are how are we getting along with this virtual environment and coming back from the pandemic? That's a Fantastic question. And, and you know what? It's great because I've never been asked that question before. Um, so when it, it first happened, I, I and I, I remember my, my my direct reports coming to me in January of 2020 when we were all just fat and happy and not, and not a care in the world. And they said some of the team wants to work remotely uh, on, on one Friday a month or every other Friday. Or it was some really small number. And I said, no way. Never going to happen. We can't do it. There's absolutely zero way we don't have the technology. We don't have the ability and people don't have the discipline. Now I'm saying, why do we ever have to go back to the office again? Uh, it's just become so handy. I, I'm more effective. I'm more efficient. My commute is from here to eight feet that way. And um, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, in terms of facilities, so many of them actually never really shut down because we are our industry is you know, considered the nutrition industry where we're uh, regulated under food. And so it was c- considered a critical uh, component uh, of, of uh, you know, of feeding the, the population. So, so many uh, did not, did not actually shut down facilities. Uh, the interesting that happened thing that happened is, and I was so impressed and all kudos go to my team, not me. Uh, inside two weeks that we went from, never having done a remote audit to having a system in place, auditors trained and executing remote audits, uh, you know, via video. Now, is it perfect? No, there's no world in which a remote audit is ever going to be as good as having somebody in a facility. We all know we've walked through facilities and you smell something that's off or the corner of your eye catches something when you're not in with remote audit, you're just, you're, you're at the mercy of whichever way the camera is panning. And so a, a remote audit is never going to be as good as, but in the eye of the pandemic, 
it was it was significantly better than doing nothing because what we saw um, were uh, several facilities kind of trying to initially in that first three months utilize pandemic. Remember, pandemic was that overarching dog eat my homework excuse. It just for everything, everybody was using for everything, and we had several companies call us and say, "You can't uh, audit us because we, you know, because of pandemic, or or our staff is overwhelmed because of pandemic." And you know, our response was, "Are you in operation? If you seek to remain certified." You will be inspected. Uh, we will do it remotely. We will not send somebody to your facility. However, you will be inspected because if you are, have the staff to be in operation to, to maintain your certification, uh, you will be inspected. And that's part of, here again, going back to that accreditation. If, if ANSI comes in and, and pulls their file and says, uh, you didn't audit them this year. It was 18 months before you audited. We lose our accreditation. So there again, who's, somebody's watching the watcher. And that's where we just were firm up front. I think toward the end, people never really lost their rhythm. Uh, companies uh, ad- adapted very quickly and, and did a great job. And there are some companies that, that we found ended up, you know, ceasing operation for a period of time just because they had a number of staff out. Uh, that was far, far and few between. Most people had it really handled because if you think about it, our, our industry operates in a place of quality you know, day in, day out for a living in terms of masking up, nothing new, gowning up, nothing new, washing hands. We should be incredibly familiar with that. And so that's of any industry, we should have been prepared to at least behave appropriately uh, in the face of a pandemic. What about the retailer? Is where are the retailers in this process? Yeah, for a long time, the retailers were silent. The retailers were uh, were, were um, just kind of doing their thing and, and selling products. And interesting, there's there's been an interesting trend that started about five years ago, and uh, it was NSF was actually approached by CVS and a colleague of mine named Alan Perlman, and I worked with CVS to develop a trust program. And at that point, a trust program was pretty much something that never had been heard of. And CVS developed a program that started with we just want to have our suppliers audited and and it it evolved to if you're going to be in our store your product will either be tested or certified so if you don't have it certified you have to get it regularly tested to a level that doesn't is doesn't equate to certification but is close to and so we rolled that program out with cvs um about five years ago and that that um cvs is still doing that uh it's their um it's their uh, tested to be trusted uh, program. And it's in the wake of that, other retailers, most recently Wegmans, which is headquartered in Rochester, New York. And if you don't have the um, luxury of having a Wegmans store near you next time you're in the Northeast, you got to go into one of these stores. They're one of the coolest grocery stores. And I, I, I get it. If you've not been there, you're thinking it's a grocery store, pal. Uh, I, cause I had the same attitude and then I went into one and I thought, oh my God, this is an experience. This is not a grocery store. This is amazing. Uh, you know, from their fresh food, food to, you can get, you know, a 99 cent can of mushrooms all the way up to fresh truffles from Italy at, you know, a lot of money per ounce. I don't even know what the current market price is for a truffle, but it's more than I can pay. Um, and it's really an experience. So I say all that to say Wegmans is a brand that has always been recognized for quality. They're always in the, the uh, very top of the Forbes, you know, best companies uh, list. And forever, they were able to have the luxury of just saying, our name is our certification. Our name is our quality seal. And then they took a, um, a you know, philosophical change and said, you know, we want to assure our clients that it's, it's more than just our name, but somebody standing behind it. So they rolled out their quality program. Uh, it, it started actually a year and a half ago. And it's the same thing. If you're going to be on the Wegmans shelf, it's uh, you, you are either going to be tested or you're going to be certified. And 100% of the, the brands that are on their shelves that are, that are supplements are manufactured in a facility that, that is audited, audited to the national standard, NSF ANSI 4552. So retailers are really starting to take this seriously. Amazon uh, a little over a year ago, rolled out their their requirements to be on their website, and so they there's no longer there's no longer that void thinking, 
in terms of retailers. Retailers are actively engaged. And what I will tell you is Target also rolled out their program, Target Clean, uh, earlier this month, late last month. Uh, and I can tell you um, that uh, that at least uh, three or four other retailers are looking at having uh, some sort of a certification program or trust program in place. Uh, so retailers are taking this incredibly seriously. Well, just to, to you know, bring it in, in for a landing, what's happening is retailers have, have recognized that, that they are a very important part of this. Um, and we can go out as an organization individually and approach companies and say, you know, the right thing to do is, you know, pursue certification, communicate with your customers. And that's fine and good one by one. Some people, some brands say, we, we see value in this, we're going to go for it. Other brands say, you know, it's, it's not a priority for us. But the fact that the retailers have now gotten involved and said, if you want to be on our shelf, if you want to be in our, our digital marketplace, you will live up to these quality standards. Well, they're the 800 pound bear in the room. As if I'm asking people to do it, it's voluntary. If Target, Wegmans, CVS, Amazon, and, and others are saying, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna sell through us, you're gonna do this, it becomes less voluntary. And then it becomes the, 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 the required law of the land, the de facto law of the land which is great because then consumers start to learn about it. And then a consumer knows the difference between what's good and what's bad. David, you know, uh, longtime listeners of the fearless workplace will know I am something of an expert in supply chain management. And uh, so as you have dealt with the pandemic and doing what you do, how has supply chain risk changed uh, over the past couple of years? Are you seeing more political risk? Are you seeing more operational risk? Has the push towards inventory, you know, as a solution, at, have we uh, caused any problems? Are we seeing issues with maybe less creditable vendors being brought in in order to, to provide badly needed supplies? Yeah, when there's when there's shortage uh, of supplies, there's opportunity for uh, for fraud or malfeasance or bad behavior. And it go. I, I, I sat and listened to um, a gentleman from Nestle at a at a conference, and, and he just blew my mind. A great, great presentation. When he, I, I was thinking, you know, of course, my world. I'm thinking raw materials, uh, the things that go into what you're actually consuming. But he starts talking about the price of glue has gone up tenfold. The price of of cardboard and boxes has gone up tenfold. The price of bottles has gone up tenfold. And even then. You may not get the color cap that you have built your brand, you know, image on. So whereas your cap may have been green this week, all of a sudden you're getting a shipment of black caps and that's what you can get. Um, and I think the real danger in that becomes, and, you know, the, and the price of shipping. I mean, the price of shipping has just become absolutely insane. And I, you know, some of it's potentially op, uh, opportunistic. Uh, some of it is just, you know, the availability of supply, but I think the real fear and danger in that is, is, um, and I think this is a real blind spot for the industry is the raw material. It's it becomes very tempting to say if you let's say turmeric is your raw material, well this 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 orange powder is just as good, and it may not all be turmeric, but it's darn close enough, and it's not going to kill anyone. Um, and you know whey protein has uh, whey has gone. Through the roof in terms of expenses so uh, what we saw was a, a lot of uh, amino acid spiking in that now is amino acid going to kill you no not in the least is it uh, is it uh, are you pay, getting what you're paying for no so that's that's I, th I think there's been a lot of opportunity for it and I'm you know, I'm certain there's there's been some real bad behavior going on and that's just why it's been even more critical to have, you know, have your good manufacturing practices in place to be doing the ID testing when something comes through your back door so you know you're actually getting what you're paying for and the finished product testing. It's never been more critical uh, to be watching out for that. So when, when you're educating your customers, David, uh, 
these people have got uh, they're 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 trying to mitigate risk and and uh, allay fear for what they're doing in their process in their supply chain. Uh, do you see knowledge or uh, best practices in one area translate into another? And uh, I'm thinking the the I don't know. This is this is pretty uh, pedestrian, but uh, uh, you know, uh, when I uh, really want to embarrass myself, I go and grab my bag of sticks and I go get a little round ball and I hit it off into the woods and stuff like that, you know. And when I'm standing over that ball, and even though I don't have got nothing really riding on the thing any more than who's going to pay for beer uh, at the club. I, I'm, I'm scared to death. My knees are, are shaken. But, but what I have found is that I can mitigate that by not thinking about the outcome. I, I think about how I'm going to produce a reproducible swing. Okay, so that, that works for me. And I actually found that I could, when I was going into like a work type situation and trying to do something that I was scared at, I might have to give somebody some really bad news, you know, and I would find that that could translate. Uh, it's just a kind of a crazy example, but do you find that kind of thing when you're, when you're talking to your customers? Yeah, you know, we, you know, my approach has been that I have to love my customers, customers enough to tell them the truth. I got. I have to tell them what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And I've had, I've had so many uncomfortable conversations, and you know this career has, has toughened me up significantly because I always wanted to be liked. You know, I always wanted to tell people, oh, everything's great. You're gonna love this, but you, you recognize you really, you're really harming somebody by telling them what they want to hear and not what they need to hear. And I've had so many very difficult, difficult conversations um, with clients. And in, in essence, you have to say, look, it's not you. You're not a bad person. It's just there's a knowledge gap. And we, we and the good news is we can get you there. The bad news is you're not there yet. But at least you found it with us. And now we can get you there quickly. And then depending on the criticality of, of that, that knowledge gap, we can say to them, you really need to act immediately. Or you let's start working on this. You have you have a little time, but we do need to get this solved. You know, David, being also a self-described expert in auditing and inspection, uh, I have never known an auditor inspector to not have a really good, funny story about an audit that went south. Uh, without naming any names, could you give us a, the highlights of one of those stories? I can. I can tell you a couple and I've been and I, I will gladly tell you there are so many fine and really good facilities that I gladly uh, take products that come out of there that I, I am so pleased to be associated with an industry that these facilities are in They're The vast, vast majority of them are doing a great job. I think of one walking through there and they were proudly showing off their lab and they had, I don't know if it was HPTLC or some bit of equipment and they were talking about their robust testing program. And we said, but your equipment is still crated. And he said, yes, well, I said, well, how are you running any tests? It's crated. And, but he just kept telling about how robust his testing program was and his lab was, and that was the only piece of equipment in the lab. Um, that would be one. Um, uh, another would be, if you recall, um, uh, probably about six or seven years ago, there was this mad rush for candy companies to start producing gummies when gummies became the delivery system of choice. And my daughters love to rib me about gummies because I'd constantly tell them, there's no way that you're getting the same. You, if you really want all you need, you got to take a pill. Uh, but, you know, they, they love the delivery system of a gummy. I'm trying to explain that, you know, you got to you gotta have so much sugar. And, and anyway, I'm, I'm a purist. But going through this facility with this company and I'm looking and it starts with, you know, the cornstarch molds. And I said, well, how often do you change your cornstarch? Is it every six months or so? And I said, well, that, are you not afraid that, you know, cross contamination? And, and at this point they're telling me, we're no, we're just a candy company. This is all we're required to do. I said, that seems 
I don't know what the price of starch is, but I think you should be changing that out with a, with a lot more frequency than that. And I'm looking, of course, you're seeing the buildup of filth on the pipes up above and they're wheeling trays of gummies around this facility with no covers on them. And, and that's making me nervous. And I'm watching also, I noticed this trend is employees are walking by and jamming their hands into the tub of gummies and then just firing them into their mouths. So just walking by, grabbing a handful of gummies and firing their mouth. And I say, you can't, you can't do that. And he said, oh, it's just a little perk of working here. You know, you get to have a little candy while you are. I said, you can't directly put your hand. And this was kind of the, the, and it just kind of kept going and going and going. And finally got to the last line and they were producing a gummy. And I looked down and it was uh, a gummy fortified with, with B12, I think, or B6 and B12. And I said, wait a minute. And I pulled it up and I pulled the package and the package said supplement facts on the side. And I said, you're already in the supplements business. He said, no, we're not. They just send us the, the pre-blend and the packaging and we're just putting it together. So we're not in the supplements business. And I said, well, unless those are growing on some B vitamin gummy tree that I'm unaware of and you're just picking them like fruit, you're mixing a vitamin pre-blend into a gummy. You are in the vitamin business, pal. And, um, we never worked with that company. I think they, and they, they, they ended up saying, we don't know that, that we want to pursue it or, or that we want to pursue it in a rigorous way. And the funny thing was, and they were so sweet, you know, they were lovely people. They just, they, they just weren't, they're were swimming in waters they weren't familiar with. And, and as they sent me away, they took me into their, their company store and said, pick anything you want to take home to your kids. And, I, I think I got about two blocks away from that was f- firing. I tell you, I politely took two bags of candy and firing them into a garbage can. I am not, I wouldn't eat out of your vending machine, let alone, you know, after watching that, you know, but the, the great news is, is there's, there's hope for everyone. Anybody can correct. I have seen when I first, I've seen facilities go from horrible reputation to great reputation. And it takes commitment, investment, an effort and people, you know, the leadership of a company has to look at quality as an investment, not a cost. They have to be committed to it and, and, uh, and then speak that into the culture so that the culture changes and Norm's an expert on that, but it's, it's a matter about bringing everybody along for the ride so that everybody sees their, they have a part and a voice in quality and it can be done. And that's the great news is, is people can turn things around and can, you know, become a victory story. And that's, that's what I love about my job is, is seeing the good players get better and the people who, who maybe aren't there yet, but have a real commitment come along and get there. That's, that's, that's great. I think that one of the uh, best written warning letters I've ever seen from FDA was some, the way they wrote it up that uh, the commercial leaf blower that was being used to clean off their tableting machines was not properly qualified. (laughs) (laughs) That's creative. I'll give them that. (laughs) You do see some creative solutions out there. Yeah. Not the kind of creativity we want. (laughs) So David, uh, so, you talked about something of which you'll be surprised. I'm a little bit of an expert, right, on culture change. So I know that a lot of times when you darken somebody's door, sometimes they're not as receptive to seeing that you're visiting today as you know as you might like. Uh, what can we do to help leaders uh, and people that are working in this industry? to really embrace the information that they're going to get from having a third party like yourself take a good deep dive on how we're doing. You know, it's, it's acknowledging that ignorance of the law is not forgiveness. And we're not there to enforce. We don't turn around and submit anything to the FDA. You know, we don't, we're there to help. We really are to help them, there to help them. And just because we're finding it 
doesn't mean we're creating it. And that can be sometimes a misconception of an audit. You found it, therefore we, it wasn't a problem until you were here. It was a problem before we got there. And if we don't come and you don't fix it, it will remain a problem. And so looking at us as a, a, um, as a partner in your quality schemes and your partner, partner in your risk management, uh, that's, the, that's how to get it done. And yeah, there have been, been occasions where we've gone in and said, these are the problems. And there, we've had a couple times where clients didn't have that spirit of humility, where they, they just said, you know, you're just calling our baby ugly. And it's, it's no, we're actually really here to, to help you fix this situation. Um, to a point where I, I fired one or two clients just because they, they were argumentative over it. It's like, we're not here to argue with you. And we're not here to, to create problems. We're here to help you fix things. And it's those companies that come through it saying, we know. We're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. As soon as you introduce humans to the equation, there's there's this this imperfection. But those companies who come in it saying, we're going to be humble enough to acknowledge we have we have issues, but bold enough to say we're going to fix them. And that's and, and that's you know starts. It's a leadership down, and, and but it's everybody up. It's from the the lowest to the highest and back down again. David, do you find when you're looking uh, at an organization, uh, do you uh, look at the culture of the organization to uh, and see how the uh, treatment of the employees uh, uh, affects the quality of the product? So that's that's not necessarily the, the purpose of our audit, and I'm sure though it becomes obvious. I mean, our auditors it's it's they're not people who just well i just graduated from school and now i'm rolling right into this our auditors are all trained and calibrated uh, across the globe and we have auditors in china india throughout europe north america so, uh, japan so wherever product is being either consumed or manufactured we tend to have auditors um, so one our auditors have a great deal of experience and they would pick up on that so it's not not necessarily the purpose of our audit to audit their culture but they're going to see it real quickly. They're going to see it in how people respond. They're going to see it how people are interacting with each other, and it's those. And that's where a um, an in person audit, and I'm so grateful we're back to them, is so much better because you see those nonverbal cues between people. You see people's reaction, and that will that can guide an auditor to maybe dig a little deeper here or push a little a little harder there and see what's going yeah. on. Because you know that if the culture's not right. You're going to find the objective outcome from that somewhere. One hundred percent, absolutely. David, uh, put a final question for you tonight. So, putting yourself in the shoes of someone who's new to auditing, I know that one of the, one of the biggest fears that a new auditor has is doing just what you were just talking about, which is here's the finding, here's the evidence, here's what we need to be fixed have fixed and then having significant pushback from a client uh, and, you know, things can go south really fast. How do you get your auditors to overcome that fear uh, of, you know, being kind of bullied by a client because you're telling them something they don't want to hear? Well, we would start with the fact that most of our auditors have minimum 10 years industry experience. So they've come from an environment where they've been in a facility. So, it's going to be hard to fool somebody who comes from that. So, you know, they, they tend to know. Uh, second, um, we back their play. So unless something egregious has happened, and that's not to say every auditor's behaved perfectly every time. There have been times where we've, we've had to, you know, reel in an auditor or make sure that, that you know, that, you know, that, you know if, a, if a client has an issue with a finding, they have ways to appeal that. And there have been times we've overturned those and it doesn't happen just through us. We have an internal quality department that oversees us. And so it goes outside of mine. So there's an objective part of NSF that will review that. Uh, but the auditor knows that, that, that um, if they're doing the right thing, their play is backed and they know they can call us. Uh, we had a situation, well, the first one that comes to mind is an, is, um, an auditor was walked to their car by the owner of the company after the end of the first day. And the um, owner of the company said, um, it's really important to us that this audit goes well. And he dropped a paper bag on the rental car, the front seat of the rental car of the auditor. 
and it was an incredibly expensive watch. It, not not uh, probably Rolex level, but we're talking, you know, $500 watch. Uh, and the auditor just did the right thing, and they know their career is not worth a $500 watch. And so they called back to the office and said, what do I do? And we said, you do not return to the facility tomorrow. Um, go from there. FedEx the watch, write up these notes, FedEx the watch back to the office, and you're done there. And so they know we're going to protect them in terms of, of any sort of aggressive behavior. And there's been other times where people become aggressive with auditors and they know at that point, um, just leave. If, if somebody's not going to be professional in an environment, we're not going to expose anybody to that. Just as we wouldn't, we would uh, not ever have a customer exposed to aggressive or bad behavior. David, thank you. We've learned a lot today about an industry that you could probably tell from my questions. I don't know a whole heck of a lot about. Uh, so thank you for dispelling some of that misinformation and sharing your insights with us today, not just on what you do in this industry, but in the broader sense of auditing and inspection and testing. Uh, folks, if you want to talk to experts like David, if you want to hear what they have to say and their unique perspectives on, on areas that you may not be familiar with, you got to listen to the fearless workplace. And let me tell you, if you are a quality professional, you could hear David's concern for quality, his passion around it. If you want to join the ranks of people like David, you need to be a member of the American Society for Quality. And if you should make the very good decision to join ASQ, you will definitely want to join the team of Workplace Excellence Forum, where topics like this uh, are discussed, where, we, where solutions are found, and where occasionally, just occasionally, some really funny anecdotes about audits that went south can be heard. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Norm. Thank you, David. David, your last word for our audience. Well, I just want to first thank you, gentlemen. It's been a real treat to be here. And uh, it's a real pleasure to maybe uh, clear up some misconceptions about the dietary supplements industry. Uh, in terms of uh, for the audience, I would just say, as you're looking for products, uh, look for good products and do your research. Uh, it doesn't take a long time to figure it out. So make sure you know what you're putting in your body. Uh, and I would look for a product that is NSF certified, of course, and, and just really be understanding of that because as the consumer, it's, it's ultimately your responsibility to know uh, what you're putting in your body and the quality of that product. And that information is, is definitely out there. You just may have to dig a little bit, but it is there for you.